Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Welcome back to all of our ICC family participants here for the third Sunday of Advent as we stand now just, believe it or not, days from the great feast of the Nativity of Christ our God. And so we kind of enter in really to this more intensive preparation now for the feast and the church helps us enter into that more intensive preparation by giving us the eyes to see, the vision, expectation of what's coming. You know, uh, Father Sebastian, first of all, good to have you back with us again. And uh, you remember Father Joseph, Frank of Villa would always say, uh, where there is no expectation, there will be no fulfillment. And uh, we, could, we, could, we could reverse those words, say where there is expectation, God will not disappoint us. And so let us uh, enter into these final days of Advent with that great expectation of what coming and what God has prepared for those who open their hearts to him. The church places before us this Sunday, Isaiah chapter 35. So you might want to take out your pen and write down these notes. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1 through 6, and tacking on the end, verse 10. So for chapter 35, verse 1 through 10. Uh, Psalm 146, Psalm 146, Uh, the Alleluia verse, which we'll get into a bit here, is from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, the gospel from Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 through 11, and then finally the epistle from James chapter 5, verse 7 through 10. You know, I love these studies we're doing because it's like it's like a little Bible study the church puts together for us. And for those that have a little time and can and can uh, study these things, it's a wonderful, wonderful bringing together of these texts, which we're going to see here, are meant to be brought together. Uh, you know, the New Testament author is quoting, and Jesus is quoting texts from the Old Testament. So the church is just kind of bringing these together for us, saying, "See, here are all these." All these prophecies of what's going to come. Here's the fulfillment of what's what what's what's going to come or what was prophesied. And then here's how that applies to our life. So let's jump right in here to Isaiah chapter 35. Get out our Bibles, chapter 35, uh, verse starting with verse one. Isaiah chapter 35, beginning with verse one. The desert and the parched land will exult. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers and rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God, strengthen the hands that are feeble, make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those whose hearts are frightened, be strong and fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication divine recompense. He comes to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf be cleared. Then will the lame leap with like a stag. Then the tongue of the mute will sing. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. They will meet with joy and gladness, sorrow and mourning will flee. You know, Father Sebastian, this is one of those texts that I, I oftentimes think most people read, most Christians read, as kind of like a New Testament text. It just sounds nice. Uh, we, and we know Jesus opened the eyes of the blind and made people speak and all these things. So we kind of almost read it as though it's, a, it's in the gospel. But here Isaiah is living some time before the New Testament and speaking to the Old Testament church. You know, sometime, you're going to help us with this, sometime before, during, after the Babylonian exile. And so... So let's get back into that time period in the context. Why was, when was Isaiah living? Why was he writing what he's writing? Who was he talking to? Well, he was preaching at a time that corresponds to someone who you have a liking to. If we look at the next chapter, in chapter 36, it says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Shechereb, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. So that gives us a little window into the historical context. In fact, Isaiah is written 
the, the form of the book as we have it in this, this post exilic form of the book in which we have scrolls of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied over a long period of time, scrolls of Isaiah interwoven with snippets from second Kings and second Kings is a book that is not completed until at least the exile is well on its way. As we know from reading the last chapter of second Kings. So the, the, the form of Isaiah here is a, it's a post exilic form in which the, uh, the, the editor, probably Ezra, according to the rabbinic tradition and many of the fathers, has given us this book so that in the post-exilic period, the, the hearers would read it in the his, original historical context, as we're talking about right now. What was that historical context? Well, you got to go back to the time of Hezekiah. So Hezekiah was a king down in the south in Jerusalem of the line of David. And the, during his time, the Assyrian Empire came and conquered the northern region. And then, because Hezekiah refused to submit to Assyria, the Assyrians came and attacked Jerusalem. And the story continues, as we read in 2 Kings, with Hezekiah praying for salvation and the prophet Isaiah directing him on what to do. Hezekiah and Isaiah worked very closely together. And as a result, the angel of the Lord came out and wiped out the Assyrian army. But that's beyond the story where we are right here, where before that's occurred, the, the Assyrians are now on their way. Isaiah gives a prophecy. Not only does he give prophecies about a coming chastisement of the people of God, but he also prophesies, especially as he's moving closer towards the middle and then the later part of his book, he starts prophesying more and more about a restoration that's coming. That even though the, the, there may be a chastisement coming for the people, even though the enemy may attack, they will not, in the end, destroy, utterly obliterate the people of God. But there will always be a restoration of God's people back to what it was before and even something greater. And so that's what we see here. We have this beautiful image of a restoration of God's people that will come after a chastisement. You know, you, you mentioned this theme of salvation, and we're going to get into that quite a bit today, but, but let's start that right here, because here in this, in this text, it says, here is your God, he comes with vindication, with divine recompense, he comes to save you. Help us understand, what does that mean for the people of the Old Testament? So we think, when I ask a uh, if I were to, you know, stand outside a Catholic church mass let now and say, what does it mean to be saved? Well, unfortunately, most people actually probably wouldn't know what to say to that question. But it certainly means something different or at least something more to a Christian. Or the, our concept may, may have, have, have changed. So let's understand that because I think when we get into the New Testament text, it's also important. Absolutely. So the New Testament uses the word salvation. Uh, we hear about that verb being saved and things like that. And like you said, today it's yeah. taken on some different meanings. There's been a shift. And that shift is really, it's a, it's a dualistic shift, as we'll talk about in a second. But, but if we go back into the first century, we go back into the first century, the Christian era, we go back to the time of Jesus and the apostles, their understanding of the word salvation being saved was in line with what we find here in the Old Testament. And that's why we need to make sure that we, we kind of maybe right the ship here a bit because we're often misunderstanding what's really being said in the New Testament about being saved and salvation because we don't understand the Old Testament context. And so the Old Testament context is, is salvation, being saved from bodily death. When, when your enemy was attacking... You were afraid you were going to die. When the enemy comes at you with his sword and the, sword and the, and the spears and, and, the, and the battle ensues, at that moment, you are concerned about whether you are going to live to, the, to survive the battle. And if you don't survive, who else might not survive? Will your army all be conquered? And then will your, the enemy army go and attack the city where your wife and children and great-grandparents and parents are, are, are waiting? So the men would go out for battle. But if the men were not successful in battle, if they weren't victorious over the enemy, then the, the enemy's army would conquer the army and, and come and attack your city where your wife and children and parents and grandparents are waiting, hoping that they're going to hear good news. And this is another word we hear, this idea of glad tidings or good news. 
the to the good news that will come to the people waiting in the city is a, vic, a, a proclamation of victory for the battle line. And we hear this word, we hear this idea, glad tidings, good news, all over the Old and New Testament. And it's intimately intertwined with this idea. When you went out to battle, you hoped that you could send a runner back to the city announcing good news, that your army has been victorious over the enemy's army. And you have been saved. You, your army has been saved. Your city has been saved. The people have been saved. Saved from what? Death. From death. And this is something that's often missing in our understanding of the New Testament and the use of that language. And incredibly important for our season that we're celebrating now. Absolutely. As we make our way to the Feast of the Nativity of Christ, this theme continues here in the responsorial psalm. Lord, come and save us. And I, you know, I, I think I oftentimes look at these, the responsorial psalm as this intentional kind of pedagogical moment, a spiritual and pedagogical moment for God's people during the liturgy. That this, this salvation which Isaiah called for, which as you're saying, is very much a kind of incarnational salvation. I mean, it was, it was a real battle. The enemy is real. And he's coming after us to kill us, but God is going to be victorious. The king is going to be victorious. And uh, it's, the response to the psalm is kind of this opportunity for us to open our hearts to this truth. We know what's coming, and we know what God's going to do. And I accept this reality. And we cry out then with Isaiah, with the people of the Old Testament, with the Christians, come, Lord, come and save us as we prepare ourselves for uh, for the feast of, of Christmas, you know, here in the response to ourselves also, the, in the last text, it says, your God, O Zion, through all generations, which it picks up also from Isaiah, here, the last verse, those whom the Lord has ransomed will return and enter Zion singing, crowned with everlasting joy. That theme of Zion, if I'm not mistaken, Father, is, they're, they're talking about Jerusalem, literally, physically, Jerusalem, the city. So we, we get these images in mind, and, and uh, they're so important. At the beginning of this Old Testament te text, the desert and the parched land will, will exult. The steppe will rejoice and bloom. They will bloom with abundant flowers, rejoice with joyful song. The glory of Lebanon will be given to them. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. These are the mountains of the Holy Land. These are right. These are, can you imagine the mountains with the trees and all the greenery and the rivers flowing? And all the desert land is going to become like this. And the, way, the, the wasteland, I, I almost think you could see the wasteland behind the army as the army marches through and just destroys everything is, is going to be, be restored again. And this is what's going to come to us. And uh, you know how timely this is. When you have this image of the Old Testament in mind, when you have the image of the prophet in mind, and then you can then properly apply it to our life. I was just on Al Cresta's show recently, and I remembered a, a priest that had said to me one time, he said, you know, Father, he said, I look across the, um, the, uh, the, the, the land, which is the church, okay? And it, it's, it's just like a wasteland for like 40, 50 years. It just looks like a wasteland. I mean, the convents are empty. The, there's no vocations. The, the, you know, nobody's, the people aren't getting their babies baptized. It's just, you know, and he says, but then as I look closer, there's, it's like the first rains that have come down. And there's, a, there's just almost imperceptible green growth. And, and here, I think it, we can properly apply this vision of Isaiah to our situation today. I mean, we look across the church, there's, a, there's some pretty scary stuff going on. And people are losing hope. But God has a plan, and he's going to be victorious. As we prepare for the coming of the nativity, we're going to be called, as we're going to see very shortly, be called to this renewal of our understanding of the incarnation of God in our life, and how he has come, and he has begun this restoration in and through us. Uh, it's so important. Let's take a look here at the, uh, the Alleluia verse and spend a little bit of time again in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, which is a, quite an important moment in the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. And, Father, I'm going to ask you to comment on this because this is a text that I think of. I thought Jesus said this in the gospel. I think it's the gospel of Luke when he goes to Nazareth, right, to the, 
the synagogue in Nazareth and rolls the scroll, he quotes this text of Isaiah, doesn't he? Uh, what does this text mean back there in, in, in its original context? Well, if you go back to Isaiah's time, this is one of those, we're looking at the second half of the book of Isaiah, from chapter 40 all the way through chapter 66, the second half of the book of Isaiah is primarily restoration language. The, the first half, chapters 1 through 39, is pretty much gloom and doom, chastisement's coming. And there is certainly a weaving back and forth in both sections, but this second half, by the time we get to chapter 61 now, we're coming to the close of the, book of, of the second half of Isaiah, and, and so it's primarily just restoration, restoration. It's climaxing now as we're getting into the 60s, 61, 62, all the way to 66. And so in 61, you have the voice of the Messiah here. The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, that should remind us of the story of the anointing of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10. It should remind us of the anointing of David in 1 Samuel chapter 16. When the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon these individuals, they became the anointed ones, the ones that had the Spirit, by the gift of the, the oil, the oil on their head. That was an outward, visible manifestation or sign that there was an inward change taking place. They were receiving the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, so that these individuals could rule over the people of God. This is why you know, Solomon prays for wisdom. He said, this is God's people. This is God's kingdom. Now I'm going to have to do this. So I'm going to have to be like God. I'm going to have to have the wisdom of God. And so God gives to his kings his spirit to, so that they might walk in his ways. And what is the primary job of the king? If we go back and look at 1 Samuel chapter 10, we can see there the description of the king. To rule over God's people and save them from their enemies round about. That's the, the description, a twofold job. And so we hear in Isaiah this prophecy, the voice of the coming Messiah, that someday the king, the Messiah, the anointed king, will return to Jerusalem. And it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, right? The gift of the, the, the oil was that gift of the Spirit. But what was his job? To bring glad tidings to the poor, or whatever translation you want, to bring good news to the poor, or we could say the word gospel, good spell, the old English word, to bring that victory proclamation to those who are desperate for it. And well, who were those poor? Well, it's this faithful remnant. The, the, the people of Israel have been destroyed. They've been obliterated. The Assyrians have wiped out the northern kingdom. The, the Babylonians wiped out the southern kingdom. And Isaiah's prophesying that someday these things will be restored. Someday these things will be restored, and they're going to be restored by the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come, and he's going to conquer the enemy. There will be an announcement of good news from the, from the battlefield that your God reigns. And who's going to do all this? The anointed one, the Messiah. You know, this is a, uh, a bit of a challenging message as we set up our crash scenes and we prepare for the Feast of, of Christmas. So often, I think in our Western society, we've we've lost this sense of this of the kind of the military victory of Christ. That when we see Christ born of the Virgin Mary, we oftentimes in our imagination this depiction of with the angels singing and the and and so forth and bells and Christmas trees and you know Santa Claus is mixed in and things like that. We we lose we lose a bit of this sense that. That, that God has intervened in this world in a military fashion to strike down the enemy of man. And this is the truth which we proclaim at the Feast of the Nativity. And, and we, we see this then played out in the gospel here, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 through 11, which is basically just going to pick up these themes we've been talking about. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, well, starting with verse 2 and up to verse 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you heard and see, what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. 
what did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal places. Then why did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Father, place us in the proper context here of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter well, 1. Well, this is, this is beautiful, beautiful stuff here. Very rich. You have a, a quote from, well, first of all, the context. You know, Jesus is, this is somewhere uh, in the latter part of the beginning of his ministry to the middle of his ministry, somewhere in there, midway through the ministry. And John the Baptist is in prison. He's about to die, as we know. And, uh, and, but some of the disciples of John haven't yet made the transfer. John had directed his disciples when Jesus came on the scene. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. Right? We know this earlier from, in John's gospel. And uh, initially, Andrew and John, the, the evangelist, start following. And then they eventually go get their brothers, right? Peter and, and, and James and the rest of them. And then they all eventually start following Jesus, and Jesus continues to gather disciples. But there are still some that have not made the transition. And we see that as we read the Gospels. We'll see, for example, also in John's Gospel, some of John's disciples saying, Hey, you know that guy you baptized? He's making, you know, he's doing a little better business than we are now. He's, he's getting more. And he's just, this is what I told you. I, I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. He is the, he's the bridegroom. I must decrease. He must increase. So there's this transition period happening where you've got initially John's disciples, those that are ready, have been prepared for Jesus. And when Jesus is baptized, they start following Jesus from that moment. But then there are some that are maybe not yet ready. Maybe they've just started following John and they haven't yet been prepared the soil hasn't been really prepared yet in the sense, or these might be disciples who have joined and started following John after the baptism, after the baptism. So whatever the case may be, there are still some disciples that are hanging out with John. They're still in school in a certain sense, a certain at a, a preliminary stage, and they have not yet made that transition, that leap over to Jesus. And so it seems like that's what's happening here. He's got some disciples still hanging around ministering to him while he's in prison. And he sends them to Jesus and says, go ask Jesus, go ask him if he is the one or we're to wait for another. And commentators debate here. And it really doesn't matter too much which, which one is the solution. Some suggest that John the Baptist knows that Jesus is the Messiah, but he's asking this question for these remain disciples to make the transition because he knows what Jesus is going to say. Others have suggested that maybe John himself was beginning to maybe start to wonder. It really doesn't matter to us. What's critical here, because John's going to, to be martyred here very quickly, what's critical for us is those disciples. Those disciples are going to transfer now. They're moving over into the presence of Jesus. John directs them to him, and Jesus answers the question, am I the one or should you wait for another? Look, here are the signs. And he quotes from Isaiah. What we just read from our Old Testament reading, Isaiah, he quotes, he says, look, you can see that the blind have their sight, read, the, the, the dumb speak, the, the, the deaf hear, the, the poor have good news, preach them. What else do you want? And so what we get here then is a little bit of a sense of a need for some more patience on the part of, of the disciples of maybe even Jesus, but the disciples of John at that time. They wanted, they wanted Jesus to just come on the scene. They're expecting the Messiah to appear and just take over Jerusalem. And it would be Solomon's empire times a thousand overnight. But that's not what happens. The, rather, what we find is a slow revealing, a slow unveiling of who Jesus is. And that will eventually climax in his resurrection. And so that's an important lesson for us as well, of course. We can apply that, and I'm sure you can apply that for us. But it's a, we see this, this slow revealing of who Jesus is, and there's an incredibly beautiful hint there. They're waiting for the Messiah to appear, but they don't really understand what's coming. And Jesus says, John the Baptist, 
is the one of whom was said, behold, I send my messenger to prepare my way. That's a quote from Malachi, one of the last prophets of the Old Testament. During the time of Malachi, there was a crisis. They were waiting for the Messiah to come to restore the kingdom. But when the Messiah came, he was supposed to rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem, get rid of, knock, get rid of the pagans, and then the glory cloud would restore to them, come to the temple. So they were waiting for actually the return of two different kings. They're waiting for the original divine king who ruled over Israel. But they're also waiting for the return of the Messiah, the human king who ruled on earth, saving God's people and ruling over them in the name of God. Well, what Jesus begins to reveal to them here, especially as we start heading toward the end, middle of the ministry, and we're going to start seeing really big flashpoints, like at the transfiguration and then finally to the resurrection. And these little flashes have been there all the way back from the infancy narrative in Luke and in, in, in Matthew. That this Messiah is not simply that long-awaited son of David. He's not just the earthly king, but he's that divine king. Because Malachi had prophesied about the one who was to come prepare the way, the messenger for the way. He's preparing the way, preparing the way for the glory cloud to return to the temple. And so if John the Baptist is that messenger, then Jesus is the glory cloud in the flesh. You know, I'd encourage you to go back and read the prophet Malachi, especially the final chapter there, to, 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 uh, to kind of dive into what Father Sebastian is saying. You know, Father, there's a, there's a difficult or uh, maybe misunderstood statement or something we need to just to make sure we're clear on. And this is idea of the greatness of John that we, we hear about here in the, in the last part of the gospel. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, quoting Malachi. But then he says, Amen, I see you. And among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What's he, what's he talking about? Well, that is, I, I can't tell you how many times in classes we've got, you know, I, I get a question like that because it is so strange, especially if you maybe are, you have a, you're, parishioner in a church called St. John the Baptist Catholic Church, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. So it sounds strange. John the Baptist, who can be greater than John the Baptist? John the Baptist was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. He's greater than Abraham. He's greater than Moses. Right? He's the greatest of all the prophets because the job of the prophet was to be the mouthpiece of God, the one through whom the word of God came to God's people. That's the job of a prophet in the Old Testament. John the Baptist is able to point out and say, behold, there he is. All right, so John the Baptist in his many ways is the, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And yet he dies before Jesus dies and rises from the dead. He dies before the coming of Christian baptism. He dies before the, the New Testament era is really, or the new covenant is fully on the scene. And so John the Baptist is of the old covenant. And then Jesus says, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. How can that be? The least? Well, yeah. And the reason why we are confused about that is the very same confusion we began our talk today about with that dualism. The reason why we're confused about how that's possible is because we have a problem of self-identity. We have a problem of who Jesus is. We have a problem, therefore, of who we are. Right? If, if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is what we just found out here in, in Isaiah, we got a hint there, what we know, he's the incarnate God, then, then who are we? Right? Who are we? The only way we can be, at least the kingdom of God can be greater than John, is if Jesus is greater than John. And if we all agree that Jesus is greater than John, then I think we need to ask the question, who are we? You know, as we prepare for the Feast of the Nativity, that's the big question or the big statement the church places in front of us. Uh, you know, the Feast of, the, uh, of, of Christmas was originally tied to and made one with the Feast of what is called Theophany or the Baptism of the Lord. And they're, they're intimately related. And I think we can probably just come to a conclusion here because the James, the epistle of James here has just got a theme. Be patient. Just hold on. And we know it looks like 
you know, it's all coming to an end. The Assyrian Empire's attacking, right? The evil one seems to be winning. Be patient. The Lord is coming. And as we prepare in these final days for the Feast of the Nativity, we have that. Be patient. Set aside those distractions, you know, the Christmas parties, the, you know, all these things. Set those things aside. Turn off the television. Throw, you know, set aside the newspaper. Let's, get, let's be focused on what's about to take place in our life. But the Feast of the Incarnation is not. I've said so many times. It's not so much about looking back 2,000 years ago. It's about liturgically making present the reality of God entering into our life in the flesh and that's not all because because in all of the mysteries of the lord the, the the high point the purpose of the mystery is not something which is taking place in god but something which is taking place in us in other words the feast of the incarnation is is it's our feast god has taken us to himself and we've been made one with him in our holy baptism the Feast of the Nativity is our opportunity to see and renew our commitment to the reality which has taken place in our life, that we've been made one with God. The church is now the incarnation of God on earth. And you and I are his hands and his feet. As we look out into society, it looks so challenging, so bad, so many bad things going on. We are re recalled to this original identity in which we are meant to be the ones that preach the good news to the poor, to bring salvation to the world, that through the Christian, the one who has been made one with Christ, salvation will come to those in darkness. My brothers and sisters, we prepare for this Feast of the Nativity. Um, we cannot do so from the outside. We can't watch what happened 2,000 years ago. The church invites us to make that reality present in our life to open our hearts to his incarnation in my heart. To Christ our God be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.